All right, so this is the last pre-reading video because you're about to read the last annotated article. Originally, I was going to have you read an essay called The End of History by the political scientist Francis Fukuyama. Fukuyama wrote that article in the early 1990s, just after the fall of the Berlin Wall and the dissolution of the Soviet Union. It was an essay that celebrated the end of the Cold War by suggesting that what Fukuyama called liberal democracy had not only won the war, but had established itself as the last form of government. Fukuyama argued that the history was over because we would no longer witness ideological battles and that liberal democracy would continue to spread around the globe. It's a highly optimistic essay, and it has been proven wrong, even just in the past six weeks, as Vladimir Putin has attempted to reestablish the old Soviet-style dominance of the Russian Federation by invading U Ukraine. Given, in particular, the ongoing war in Ukraine, I don't see the value of having you read Fukuyama's essay. Instead, we're going to read an essay written in 2018 by science fiction novelist Kim Stanley Robinson. Robinson is the author of numerous award-winning novels, but he's perhaps best known for what is called his Mars Trilogy, a series that, according to Wikipedia, quote, chronicles the settlement and terraforming of the planet Mars through the personal and detailed viewpoints of a wide variety of characters spanning almost two centuries. Ultimately more utopian than dystopian, the story focuses on egalitarian, sociological, and scientific advances made on Mars, while Earth suffers from overpopulation and ecological disaster. I think that alone establishes Robinson as someone worth listening to about the nature of dystopia, in particular, how we should respond to the threat of real dystopia. In the essay, Robinson will explain that imaginary dystopias, quote, exist to express how this moment feels, focusing on fear as a cultural dominant. In other words, imaginary dystopias portray a dangerous future in order to expose the dangers of the present. This, I hope you'll see, is the thinking behind the analog analysis I've been asking you to think about with your films that you watched and with your podcast projects. Another way to think about imaginary dystopias is to use them to help explain the fears that were dominating the culture at the time the imaginary dystopia was created. That's a different kind of analysis, and although it's not one we've focused on this semester, given the considerations of Robinson's essay, it's worth a bit of attention here. So let me step you through this kind of thinking with a couple of examples. If you look at that list of dystopian films on our class website, you'll see that I have them arranged chronologically, and if you look closer, you'll see few a few points over the past 100 years when there were multiple dystopian films released in the same year. Two of those years were 1971 and 1995. Any of you who have taken a literature class with me know that I like to look for patterns, because patterns often point to a larger meaning. Let's look real quickly at a few of the films released in 1971. Now, for this kind of exercise, we need to acknowledge that it takes normally a few years to see a film go from idea to final release. So if we're looking at films released in 1960 or 1971, we need to bear in mind that they were probably started in the late 60s. Two of the many dystopian films released in 1971 are A Clockwork Orange and Punishment Park. In A Clockwork Orange, the leader of a violent gang of teenaged thugs who spend their nights robbing, killing, and raping the law-abiding citizens of London is forced to undergo a radical psychological therapy that makes him become physically ill at the very thought of sex and violence. In Punishment Park, a group of college students from various protest groups, such as the anti-war movement, the civil rights movement, feminists, and socialists, are arrested and tried before an emergency tribunal. Once convicted, they're given the option of spending their full conviction time in federal prison or three days trying to cross the California desert without food or water while being chased by the National Guard. Do you see a pattern here? We see young people who are challenging the rule of law and order captured, tried, and cruelly punished by the older civilized members of society. Now let's think about when these movies were made. 
They were released in 1971, just two years after the Summer of Love, the culmination of the counterculture movement of the 1950s and 60s, when young people were challenging the rules of society by questioning authority and the expectations of right and wrong. And then we saw these movies which depicted young people who had pushed back against social norms, being punished and otherwise oppressed. The year 1995 saw a slew of dystopian films, too many to go through. Many people will argue that the collapse of the Soviet Union a few years earlier spurred on the popularity. But if we focus on a few of the films released that year, we can see a different focus. In the French film City of Lost Children, a highly intelligent but malicious android is unable to dream, so he uses a dream-extracting machine to steal the dreams of children. The children are kidnapped for him by a cyborg cult called the Cyclops. In the Japanese animated film Ghost in the Shell, by the year 2029, the human body can be augmented or even completely replaced with cybernetic parts. One significant achievement is the cyber brain, a mechanical casing for the human brain that allows access to the internet and to other networks. And in the American film Johnny Mnemonic, by the year 2021, society is driven by a virtual internet, which has created a degenerate effect called nerve attenuation syndrome. Mega corporations control much of the world, intensifying the class hostility already created by NAS. Keanu Reeves plays a data courier who has loaded too much data into the implant in his brain. Again, what pattern do we see? Cyborgs, human augmentation, technological dominance, a world controlled by machines. In the late 1980s, we saw what economists now call the third industrial revolution or the digital revolution. According to Wikipedia, quote, by 1989, 15% of all U.S. households owned a computer and nearly 30% of households with children under the age of 18 owned one. By the late 1980s, many businesses were dependent on computers and digital technology. Here we see a society becoming increasingly dependent upon the very technology that's supposed to make our lives better. And here we have a series of movies taking that dependence to a frightening extreme. So that's what Robinson means when he says dystopias, quote, exist to express how this moment feels, focusing on fear as a cultural dominant. The fear of young people who won't follow the rules, the fear of computers running our lives. In closing, I'll note that Robinson is a very elusive writer. He mentions a lot of other writers and thinkers without providing any details about them. These are good things to annotate. Who is Marx? Who is Gramsci? Who is Jameson? Be sure to make the most of your last annotated reading.